For those of you that haven't joined us before, we are Astronomy in Color. We are a group of black women and women of color, and we're working to try and transform astronomy to try and make it a, a place where everyone feels comfortable, they feel like they belong, and where everybody can really thrive. Uh, for our inaugural speaker series, we wanted to hear from people who are not only amazing scientists and, and inspire us, but also have really, really uh, worked hard to change their fields and make a way for others. Uh, we wanted to hear about their research specifically, but we also wanted to hear about their journeys and their careers, and also what we can do to follow in their footsteps, any advice that they have. Uh, we're very grateful to Vipisa for sponsoring our series. Okay, it looks like we have almost everyone in. Um, I'll just quickly introduce you to the moderators for today's talk. We have uh, Tanita Ramburus hurt She completed her undergrad studies and MSc at Wits University in South Africa. She is now a PhD candidate at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, working in the Galaxies and Universe Research Group. Her research focuses on getting more detailed understanding of the metal content in the interstellar medium and investigating how gas metallicity is related to the gas cycle in galaxies. Next, we have Munira Hussein, who is currently finishing her master's in astrophysics and space science at the University of Cape Town and the South African Astronomical Observatory. Her research focuses on the effect of the cosmic web on galaxy evolution. She's also interested in understanding how society and science impact each other. And uh, finally, we have Dr. Stabile Kolwa, who is currently an early career astronomer and lecturer at the University of Johannesburg. She conducts studies on the star formation properties and the circum circumgalactic medium of distant radio galaxies, with the goal of really trying to better understand how they evolve in relation to other high redshift galax galaxy populations. Stabile has a vested interest in the improvement of STEM education in South Africa and other countries on the continent. Okay, so I'll hand you over to your moderators. Uh, over to you, Tanita. Hello, everyone. Um, it is an honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein. Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy and core cool faculty in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. She is also a columnist for New, Sci New Scientist and Physics World. Her research in theoretical physics focuses on cosmology, neutron stars, and dark matter. She also does research in black feminist science, technology, and society studies. Nature recognized her as one of 10 people who shaped science in 2020. And Essence Magazine has recognized her as one of the 15 black women who are paving the way in STEM and breaking barriers. A co-founder of Particles for Justice, she received the 2017 LGBT plus physicists acknowledgement of excellence award for her contributions to improving conditions for marginalized people in physics and the 2021 American Physical Society Edward A. Boucher Award for her contributions to particle cosmology. Originally from East LA, she divides her time between the New Hampshire seacoast and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her first book, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred is forthcoming on March 9th, 2021 from Bold Type Books. Welcome, Dr. Prescott Weinstein, over to you. Thank you, Tanita, for that introduction. And um, thank you to the organizers and to Astronomy and Color for inviting me. So let's see if I can get my slides shared. Okay, um, so the, the gist of this talk, I'm primarily gonna talk to you all about science stuff. I am gonna integrate some things about my story into the talk just a little bit. And my understanding is I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes and then we're going to have 30 minutes for discussion. So certainly people who are familiar with the work beyond my physics research, um, I, welcome, I welcome questions about that stuff, even if it's not something that I discussed in the talk. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk to you about making a universe with axions. Uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have some sense of what an axion is. Essentially, I'm a dark matter researcher right now. It's not the only thing I work on, but it's primarily the thing that I work on. And I'm pretty excited about dark matter. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be excited about dark matter too. So I am by training a theoretical cosmologist, a particle cosmologist. And so I do like to give people a general sense of what this means, particularly since this is, I guess, a mixed audience. I don't know who's in the audience. 
So cosmology is the field where we study the origins and evolution of space time and, and everything in it. So what you're looking at here is a diagram that um, starts at, you see these question marks at the bottom. This is essentially the Big Bang era. We kind of don't know what happened during this time period. Um, and then you see these, these time scales on the left side. So 10 to the minus 43 seconds is a pretty short time scale. And so obviously this figure is not to scale. And the times that we are dealing with um, really depend on how long a process takes. So we are actually concerned with cosmic inflation, which takes about, uh, which happens at about 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It happens very, very quickly. It happens in a fraction of a second. Um, we're also concerned with the formation of galaxies, which starts at about a billion years. And we think the universe is about, or at least our part of the universe is about 15 billion years old, somewhere between 14 and 15 billion. And so we're also very concerned with what happens on very large scales. So in some sense, I think about what I do is trying to make sense of the connection between what happens in this, what we call the early universe and make connections between early universe cosmology and see how to explain late time cosmology by understanding the microphysics of what happened in the early universe. So if you were talking, if you were listening to a talk by someone who did like condensed matter or atomic physics, they would be telling you that something else is like a very, very exciting question. But because this talk is my fiefdom, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I think that these questions of what happened throughout space time and how did space time evolve and how did the contents of space time evolve are the most exciting questions in the universe. So I feel like it's a pretty exciting job to, to be able to do this job. Um, I will say, and people are welcome to ask me questions about this, that being a professor of physics means that you actually spend a lot of time not doing this, but it is pretty exciting during the moments when I do get to spend time on the science. So one way of thinking about what I do is, uh, so actually I'm gonna go back to the slide and just like mark something for you all. So there's a moment about here. So it says like 300,000 years, actually like really 380,000 years-ish. Um, where the universe goes from being like kind of a particle stew where if light is trying to travel, it can't get very far and it will just bounce off of things because basically there's like this particle plasma stew thing happening. And then at about 380,000 years, the universe becomes um, transparent to light and light can actually start traveling freely through space time. So um, our snapshot of this moment is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so we can actually see and um, the remnants of this light traveling through space time. So what you're looking at here is um, a, a piece of data from the Planck telescope, which is a primarily a European space agency mission that also involved um, our NASA here in the US. And this is a temperature map. So this is the entire sky, <clears throat> pardon me. And this is the entire sky and generally speaking, something to notice about it is if I put my mouse here or if I put my mouse here, every spot on it is about the same. And um, if I put my mouse like here and then I look around in a circle, just like 360 degrees around, everything looks about the same in every direction. So what this means is that it's homogenous it's about the same everywhere and it's isotropic. It looks about the same in every direction. There are a couple of places where there are exceptions and some of that has to do with um, the fact that actually taking this data is pretty hard. The galactic plane is right in the middle of it. So um, it takes a lot of skill to actually get this map into kind of the pristine um, form that we see. Um, I always tell people that the reason I'm a theoretical physicist and not an experimentalist is because doing observations and experiment is too hard. Um, so I, I like the simple things like calculating with math, but doing, doing this kind of data collection is an incredibly difficult and impressive work. Um, so you might say, okay, but you just said it, it looks essentially the same, but there are these color variations. So this is a temperature map of the sky. It's about 2.73 degrees Kelvin. So nothing at this moment in the universe, nothing in the universe can get colder than this temperature because this radiation is all pervasive. It's everywhere. Um, but what you're seeing here is these color differences, the orange and the blue, 
are here to help us distinguish little variations in temperature. So these variations are really smart, small. They're one part in 10 to the five, so decimal with a few zeros after it. So they're really tiny fluctuations in temperature. The reason that these fluctuations are meaningful though is that they are the seeds of structure formation. So they correlate to over densities of mass or under densities of mass. And those over densities and under densities are going to go on to, because of gravitation, they're going to accrete more of an over density. And eventually this is where stars and galaxies come from. So in some sense, when I say I'm trying to connect like the small microphysics to the large scale late time uh, cosmology physics, I'm trying to understand how we get from this cosmic microwave background radiation map to cosmological scales. So this is another set of data. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And what you can actually see is a very nice image here of what we might call the cosmic web. There's lots of structure formation here. Um, so for the early universe cosmologists, this is gonna seem pretty local because this only goes out to a redshift of 0.14 and the cosmic microwave background radiation is like redshift of 1100. But this is actually a really impressive data set. And so in some sense, what we're trying to do is go from figure out how do we write down the correct equations that evolve us from this map to this map. And so in some sense, that's, that's what I do. Um, so I, Shaz asked me if I would give a little bit of background about myself and for, the, for this group, I think um, it's particularly important. I, I will say that actually, uh, just like as, as a little note, I was really excited to be invited to speak to you and scientists in South Africa, partly because I have long been active in the National Society of Black Physicists here in the United States. And so I have been hearing updates for like 10, 15 years about the connections between our organization and the efforts to bring black physicists into South African science after apartheid. And so it's actually really exciting for me to be able to connect with people. And I want to encourage people, um, if you feel like we have science to talk about, to reach out to me and send me an email and let's talk. Um, so here's a picture of me with my parents. I was four years old when this picture was taken. It was actually a photo taken for a profile of my mother in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, so my mom looks pretty boss in this picture. I always like to point out that her hair just like looks perfectly amazing. Um, oops. So this is actually the last picture that was taken of me with my parents until I graduated from university. So it's kind of a precious photo in a different way. Um, my mom was born in a chattel house in Barbados, which is a small island in the Caribbean. It's about 14 by 21 miles. It has a population of about 200,000 people. Um, I sometimes get people asking like how my family got to Barbados. So I like to be really clear with people that they were kidnapped from Africa. And so my mom's um, ancestors were enslaved people. And um, so that's one of the reasons I mentioned that she was born in a chattel house. She was actually born in Barbados while it was still a British colony. Um, she was born at a time when children like her were not given birth certificates. So actually she only has a baptism certificate as proof of her birth. My dad, um, who you can see, clearly has a, a different racial background from my mother. He is descended from um, Jews who escaped pogroms in Poland and Russia. Um, both of, all of his great-grandparents, except for one, um, were basically refugees from pogroms. Um, it sometimes surprises people to hear that even though he was born in the United States, he actually only lived here for the first five years of his life. And then he moved to Trinidad and, to the, and basically grew up mostly in Trinidad and in the Black Caribbean part of London. Um, and actually, he still lives in a, a neighborhood that is traditionally uh, Black Caribbean and Irish. So if there's anybody who happens to be calling in from England, uh, I, I have family in Kilburn. My parents divorced when I was five. And so I was actually primarily raised by my mom. And I grew up mostly in poor and working class Latinx Los Angeles, like primarily Mexican American, Central American community. And um, we were low income and I went to public schools. So I, I tried to spell this out in a way that would be kind of like uh, broadly understandable to people who maybe aren't as familiar with American uh, so socioeconomic context. Um, but people often assume 
that because of uh, the the academic trajectory that I've had, that I had a very particular upbringing and socioeconomic background. And in fact, I'm I'm unusual um, for a Harvard graduate. As is as is Shaz. I should say Shaz was I think a year behind me in the astronomy program at Harvard when we were undergraduates. And so I I, I think it's important for people to understand me not necessarily as you know a sign that things are changing for the communities that I came from, but in some sense as an exception to the rule. Um, I guess like a few more helpful details. So I actually went to Canada to do my PhD and the story of how that happened is a little bit unusual. So I guess someone can ask me about that if they want to. I'm primarily known for my work now on axion dark matter and then to some extent post-inflationary cosmology. I'm one of currently under 100 black American women to hold a PhD from a department of physics. So what is the significance of the statistic? So in the United States, there are 2000 PhDs in physics granted every year. And in the time since, um, basically since PhDs started being granted in the United States, only I think maybe we're gonna cross the 100 threshold this year or next year, only about 100 Black American women have earned a PhD from a department of physics. Those numbers change a little bit if you include um, departments of astronomy and material science and geophysics and biophysics. But um, as we all know, all of these departments are different and have different cultures. And so um, it's really troubling given that um, Black American women make up about six to seven percent of the population, depending on what year you're counting, that of the 2,000 per year that are being awarded, under 100 total have been awarded to Black American women. Um, okay, so I think it was also mentioned in the introduction that I also do anti-colonial feminist science, technology, and society studies. So I do actually have some interest in, in what folks are thinking about in terms of like I follow Dorita Holbrook's uh, research fairly closely. I think that the work that she's doing on um, traditional astronomy systems in, in Africa um, are really interesting. And I guess actually like one comment that I wanted to make about my background also is that sometimes people say, well, like where in Africa? So I just wanna be clear that I know Africa is not a country. I know some Americans have problems with this. Um, you know, one of the horrible things about the kidnappings and the enslavement that happened is that we simply don't know. Um, and people sometimes think that like DNA tests are going to help us figure that out. But at this point, DNA tests are actually uh, not very good at that, no matter what the companies tell you. And so one of the traumas that people in the Black Atlantic really face is trying to figure out what is our identity, what is our relationship to the continent, given that we, we know we have some kind of connection, but we can never really point to a people or a community and say, this is the community where my people came from. Okay, so I thought also sometimes it's really helpful uh, to be like the, there's a person behind all of the science. And so um, <clears throat> I, I thought it would be fun to show some of these pictures. So these are pictures of me kind of throughout my training time. And as you can see, <clears throat> I got a little more professional as time went on. So this picture from 1999, I was 17. This is a food, uh, I think my first ever selfie that I took in my dorm room when I was a frosh in university. Um, the next photo is from a, a meeting of the National Society of Black Physicists. Uh, that photo was taken with uh, Haile Owusu, who is a, a fellow Black American physicist. He's now like making big bucks in data science, so he's definitely like doing better than I am economically at this point. Um, 2007, I, I like to point out that like, you know, life goes on. And so this picture is actually, I took this, I think right before I headed out to a gay club with a bunch of friends. <clears throat> and when I was in graduate school, I was pretty heavily involved in the queer student organization. And as a postdoc, I was also very involved in organizing queer stuff for the astronomy community. So 2011, this is a photo of me giving a tutorial at the National Society of Black Physicists on black holes and space time. I, I actually think that this photo from 2012 is, I, so I think this was our housewarming party. This also doubled as my um, 30th birthday party. 
And the most recent photo from 2017 is a photo of me actually giving a lecture on feminist philosophy of science at Burbeck College at the University of London. Um, so I think it's helpful to remind people that there's like a human component to doing the science. And so, you know, I was training very seriously as a scientist, but also along the way, I was like, you know, leading life. It's also important to say, so one, I guess like the one comment I will also make is that this is what a physicist looks like. Um, I, I think we get a certain image of what a physicist looks like. I am from a long line of black intellectual thinkers who use techniques that we would call science today. So there are some named examples that we have. There are also many unnamed examples, particularly people who were enslaved. We tend to think about like plantations as like places where um, I think the way that it was taught to me, the way that I heard it as a kid was that it was places where people were sort of brainlessly picking cotton or brainlessly cutting cane as in the case of, of Barbados where my ancestors were enslaved. And um, really enslaved people were running the plantations. So um, enslaved people were like expert engineers, midwives, agriculturalists, plant biologists. Um, in the case of, uh, you know, other scientific techniques, so you know that, I'll, that I say people across the continent of Africa use vaccination-like ideas, devised astronomical systems, and more. In the United States, the first smallpox inoculations actually occurred because an enslaved Black man who had been kidnapped from Africa, whose, whose name, we know him by his enslaved name, Onesimus. Onesimus explained to New England colonizers who um, didn't, who were basically suffering from smallpox, how to inoculate against smallpox. And this is knowledge that he had brought over with him from the continent. So when we talk about these debates about vaccinations and inoculations today, I actually try and remind people that the first inoculations that we know of that occurred among um, colonial settlers in the United States occurred because a black African taught them how to do it. So I, I know that sometimes people talk about me as a barrier breaker and there are ways in which I'm a barrier breaker in the professional institution of academia. But I think it's really important to recognize that I am part of a long line. And um, those of you who are science students and scientists in the audience, you're a part of a long line of, of thinkers that um, black people are not actually new to science, even though sometimes that's how we're talked about. And I think it's, that's actually really condescending. Um, so just to kind of like give a, a sense of my academic trajectory, I think of cosmology as fundamental physics. As a graduate student, I worked on cosmic acceleration and addressing it using modifications to general relativity or connections to quantum gravity. Um, as a postdoctoral researcher and now faculty, I've thought about questions relating to how do we calculate in quantum field theory? Um, how do we understand the evolution of space time and particle production, so post inflationary reheating, and what is the dark matter? And you can also see that I went through a lot of institutions before I landed where I am now at the University of New Hampshire. Um, so being an academic is also physically grueling in a lot of ways. I had to move every single time I moved institutions, and often these moves were across the continent. Um, so the United States is, is fairly big, so I was often making like 2,000 mile long treks as I moved between um, different locations. Okay, so another way of thinking about the science that I do is basically just asking in some ways, what is the universe made of? So we think from observational evidence that actually the stuff that we would consider to be normal matter, like everyday stuff like us, and you notice on the slide, I say normal matter in quotes, um, is really like only about like 5% of, of um, what the matter energy content in the universe is. So you'll notice also that I specifically made a point of putting black people here as normal matter. And that's partly because like um, there's, there's an interesting sort of pattern in the humanities of using dark matter as an analogy for black people. And I actually like to remind folks, and I think that this is really important, that black people are human just like everybody else. And we are also quote, normal matter, except everything that we consider to be normal, like it's, it's snowing beautifully outside of my window right now. And um, we are what's weird in the universe. So the snow is weird. I'm weird, you're weird, we're all weird. So what is actually normal in the universe is some phenomenon called dark energy. We haven't figured out what exactly that is. Maybe it's just a cosmological constant. And then also 
most of them matter. So dark energy is really, um, and these distinctions are fuzzy, but dark energy is really an energetic component. And matter is something that's more tangible in the way that we think of like um, gravitating matter. Um, dark matter is the majority of the quote matter in the universe. So it's something that we've never seen, we've never touched, but it's also apparently most of what's, what's out there. Um, so the case for dark matter is that we apparently need more mass than we can see. If we compare how much mass we expect to be in a galaxy based on how many stars are radiating and how massive we think those stars are with how much mass we expect to be in the galaxy based on how quickly those stars are orbiting the center of the galaxy, there's a, a, a mismatch. So this orange line is what you would expect uh, if you have the mass based on um, just looking at how much matter there is based on what's radiating. And then what we see is this green line. So there's clearly, so this is a rotation curve. You have the velocity on the vertical axis and the distance from the center of the galaxy on the horizontal. And so there's a clear disconnect between um, what we call these two rotation curves. So there are two solutions to this problem. Either our theory of gravity is wrong and we're interpreting the data incorrectly. And so there actually is an active field of research, particularly the MOND model. Um, the MOND model, I think, is not as successful at explaining other forms of data as dark matter is. So I'm really going to focus on the idea that there's much more mass um, in the galaxy than what we can see. So the fundamental properties of this, it generally speaking, doesn't produce light. And that means it's only significant interaction is with gravity. So I, only, I say only significant because there's a possibility that maybe it has other interactions um, and we, we just uh, you know, haven't seen them yet. One thing that I like to be clear with people about is that dark matter is actually not a good name for it because dark suggests that it has a color and that it is a dark color. But in fact, it doesn't have a color. The real, um, the real property of dark matter essentially is that light goes through it. So it should be called invisible matter or transparent matter or clear matter. Um, that name's probably never gonna change, so we just stick with it. Um, but I just like to be clear with people that using the word dark actually gives people a bad intuition for what it is. I just wanna highlight that there are other forms of data now that indicate to us that dark matter must be out there. So I was talking to you earlier about the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, to, to fit the, the data for the CMB, um, so this, this red line is a beautiful um, a theoretical prediction, assuming dark matter is present. And then you can actually see um, that the data just matches it beautifully. Um, similarly, with, gra with strong gravitational lensing, it's very hard to explain why space-time acts like a funhouse mirror and produces arcs and images in our astronomical images of objects that actually aren't there unless we have um, some kind of uh, massive amounts of dark matter that, that are out there that we just can't see. So there is a lot of really consistent evidence. I would say at this point, the cosmic microwave background radiation is our best piece of evidence for, for dark matter, but there's a lot of evidence out there. Um, so what do we know about dark matter? So we know that photons don't interact with it much. We know that the particles are slow moving and that they're not short lived. I like to remind people that actually the short lived um, property is easy to have intuition for. If they were short lived, then galaxies wouldn't have time to form. So they have to be long lived because structure needs time to form with the, with the dark matter in it. Um, when we make these assumptions, we get a hierarchical structure formation. And so we can put these assumptions into a simulation and we get simulation res uh, images that look like this. So this is um, from the LSST collaboration, um, which is now part of the Vera Rubin Observatory. And this looks not too unlike the SDSS data that I was showing you. So you still, you do get that kind of cosmic web image. So simulations and data match on large scales, but so these are all, we, we, we have some sense of what the properties of dark matter should be, but we still can't write down an equation from particle physics, like a Lagrangian that says, okay, this is, it's this particle with this coupling constant and these self interactions. Um, 
So that's fantastic because it means that there's lots to do for theoretical physicists. So this is a Venn diagram. It was made by Tim Tate. He's the chair of physics at University of California at Irvine. And this is basically kind of a general overview of all of the different types of um, types of dark matter models that people have come up with over the years. So I'm sure there are some people in the audience who've seen a version of this figure before. The colors might look different to you. And the reason that the colors are different is because I actually asked him if I could include this figure in my book. And he said, yes. And then I said, okay, but I need you to fix it. And so the thing that he's added, and this is a new version, is that primordial black holes are now on here because since the detection of gravitational waves, primordial black holes have again become a popular dark matter candidate. So I have a few minutes left. I said I was going to talk about making a universe with axions. So in the last few minutes, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about living in this axion bubble. Um, and, and I should say also that I didn't expect to end up an axion researcher. It's not what I plan to do after my PhD. After my PhD, and so I just want to encourage students who are um, thinking about what they're going to do as postdocs to take, like you know, a very broad view of what the possibilities are. So axions come from uh, are actually a product of a solution to a problem in the standard model that has nothing to do with dark matter. So effectively, a term can be added to the QCD Lagrangian that breaks CP symmetry. This is what the term looks like. Um, this. Breaking of the CP symmetry basically means that um, the neutron would gain an electric dipole moment. That's fine, except we've never seen the neutron electric dipole moment. And at this point, our constraints are so good that we're basically at the neutron EDM is zero plus minus some, some small error. So we're fairly confident that it's not there, although people do continue to look for it. So this is solvable by introducing something that's called the pecci quinn mechanism. This is named after Roberto Pecci and Helen Quinn. And essentially, the pecci quinn mechanism takes this theta, which is a constant in this term in the Lagrangian, and upgrades it to a field. And um, the, the byproduct of this is that there's a pseudoscalar, the axion, that gains the potential via gluon interactions and has a shift symmetry. And so we actually get um, new effective terms that now have this axion particle in it. So the axion arises because we're trying to solve a, a problem in um, the standard model, particularly in quantum chromodynamics. Um, I actually think I'm going to skip this slide. The gist of it, though, is that um, the, Lagrange the Lagrangian terms that I showed you on the previous slide look pretty different from what you might be used to seeing in papers about the axion. And that's simply because in cosmological discussions of the axion, we use what is called the instanton approximation. So that's like your main takeaway from, from the slide. Um, one of the things from an astrophysical perspective that makes axions interesting is that they're pseudoscalars, so they can they, we can treat them effectively like scalars, and that means they're bosons. So I just want to remind people of the difference between a fermion and a boson. A fermion is like a stacking particle, and um, so at high temperatures it has kind of a Maxwellian distribution. As you get to low temperatures, the fermions are going to drop into the lowest energy state available to them, and because of the Pauli exclusion principle, there are are rules governing what energy state will be available to it. Bosons are completely different. They might look similar to fermions at high temperatures, but when you get below a critical temperature, um, they can all drop into the same ground state. And so this is actually a phenomenon called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And this is something that was first finally produced in the lab with rubidium-87. This is data from Gila. Um, and so you can see that they all act basically like one super wave, and that wave gets sharper as our temperature gets cooler. So one of the questions that's come up in um, dark matter physics is, does, is this something that can naturally occur with axion dark matter? And so there was a nice proposal from Sakibi and Yang in 2009 that this would occur during the matter radiation era. Um, that the that dark matter must form Bose-Einstein condensates. And so there's a bunch of technical stuff on here that I actually, I guess I won't go into. But the interesting thing, there were two interesting things about their paper, is one that they claimed that the condensation would happen not from the QCD Lagrangian interaction terms, but actually because of gravity. 
that this is what would cause them to go into the condensate state. And also that the Bose-Einstein condensate would have a correlation length that is Hubble scale. Um, so some of the, the first work that I did on the axion when I was a postdoc was actually answering the question, does axion-like particle dark matter form Bose-Einstein condensates? And does it form with these large long length scales? So the answer is yes, they do form. But in the case of the QCD axion, which is like the traditional um, a standard model solution axion, it's actually going to be small, like asteroid size. So the name asteroid is one that Aunt, my colleague from University of Amsterdam, Anna Watts, gave it. For ultralight axions, so these are axion-like particles that are well motivated by string theory, they will actually be halos with solitons at their core. So they will, they will um, be much bigger. But that depends on the mass scale. Um, so I just want to point out that there are different mass scales for different dark matter candidates, and these different mass scales are going to lead to different phenomenologies. So you have the, the ultralight dark matter, um, so QCD axions we expect are probably somewhere around here, and then the, um, the string theory motivated ones are over here. And then there's also a bunch of other candidates that I have said nothing about to you in this talk. Um, if I had more time, maybe we, we could talk about them more. Um, and I just want to point out that sometimes you'll hear these um, ultralight axions referred to as fuzzy dark matter. And um, one of the reasons that it's called fuzzy dark matter is that it tends to be wave-like. And um, so you can actually see these wave interference patterns. And so it's very different than um, treating dark matter as a classical like billiard ball style particle. Um, okay, so the, the last thing that I'll say is that a lot of my research right now has been focused on how the self interaction does actually affect the dynamics of the system. And so one of the things that I, we found in that 20, that 2014, that paper that was posted on the archive in 2014, is that the sign of the self interaction, like is gravity attractive, is the self interaction attractive actually matters for the phenomenology of the particle, like what kind of um, objects is this particle going to form? And so it turns out that for a long time, the, the, the idea behind the theory was that um, with self interactions, only Bose-Einstein condensates with repulsive interactions would be stable. And so a couple of years after the first Bose-Einstein condensate was formed in the lab, some people tried it with a, a an atom that has an effective negative scattering length, which means it has an effective attractive interaction. And what they found was actually you could create a stable Bose-Einstein condensate, but there was a limit on how many particles you could, you could put into it. So there are lots of intriguing questions here about how this, um, spell, how this unfolds for axions in galaxy halos. Um, and so I, I think that this is like one of my last slides. I'll just point out that research that I've been doing with my PhD student, Noah Glennon, and you can find um, our paper about this on the archive. We're currently revising it for PRD. So if you have opinions about it, now is a great time to send them to us. That when we ignore self interactions, here we have um, a soliton, so basically some condensed axion dark matter orbiting a central potential with no self interactions. When we include attractive self interactions, the, act the tidal stripping doesn't happen on the same time scale. And then we, when we include repulsive self interactions, you actually get a completely different um, trajectory for the tidal stripping of, of, the, of the condensed clump. So I won't, um, because I'm running low on time, I won't spend time talking about the rest of the figures. But the main takeaway is that the self interactions of the particles um, on microphysical scales matters on macrophysical scales. Um, so the last comment I'll make, we can actually look for axions in direct detection experiments using the inverse Primakov effect where an axion interacts with um, photons in a magnetic field and this produces new photons that we can detect. So the axion dark matter experiment at University of Washington where I used to work uses this effect. Um, they're currently scanning parameter space. So we have mass on the bottom here and coupling on the top. Um, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, experimental work is grueling. That's why I'm a theorist. This is hard work. 
Um, I also want to point out that we can set constraints from astrophysics. So there are lots of different ways to come at axions. So ultralight axions, this is a figure from a paper, a white paper that a group of us wrote, um, including, including Rene Lojak, who is a, a South African astronomer who's now based in Canada. Um, I also like to encourage people to remember that high energy astrophysics astrophysics can be the future of high energy physics. So this is a figure showing how we can get constraints from um, upcoming X-ray experiments, strobacks, where I lead team strobacks, which is our dark matter detection group, um, and also from gamma ray experiments and current X-ray experiments. So there are lots of different ways to get constraints from axions on axions, both from ground-based experiments and also from looking at the cosmos. Um, so I will finally stop and allow people to ask questions where I feel that we're really just beginning to start to understand what's going on with the axions. Um, and this is a really exciting time. And I think over the last six years, the, 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 commu the global community has recognized that axions are really exciting and interesting. So um, I would love to see South African colleagues, particularly my Black South African colleagues, getting involved in axions. And I'm happy to talk to people about that. All right, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, so I've got some questions that were submitted before with registration that I think I'll start with, and then I'll hand over to Sarile to um, give you the questions from the chat. So there were a few questions. Um, so first of all, one of my questions is, where can we find out more about your book and can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I was actually thinking my publicist is probably going to kill me because I didn't put a slide about the book in here. So let me let me stop sharing my screen and um, maybe someone can ask another question and then I will um, pull up a, a, a nice um, website with my book cover on it so people can see my book. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I've got another question here that is, so you've won the uh, 2021 American Physical Society Edward A. Boucher Award and were named one of nature's 10 people who shaped science in 2020 and won lots of other awards. So with all of this, how, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome in your career and how do you deal with it? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna pull up, no, don't do that. <laughs> I was just about to pull it up and then I realized my publisher has this pop up. Okay, now we will do it. I'm um, so like, I have a couple of thoughts about imposter syndrome in particular and the amount of time we spend emphasizing to people um, the role that imposter syndrome plays in their lives. So, by the way, this is my cover. I am. Um, this is from the US website. There is actually going to be sales in the UK and to Europe. And I actually don't really know. I'm, someone can ask me a question about pub the publishing industry if they want, maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that there will be a way for folks in the Caribbean and, and different parts of Africa to get it. And I actually have been asking my publisher this question. So I will be motivated again today to ask them what the deal with that is. I am, about imposter syndrome. So I think for those of us who come from um, groups that are marginalized relative to the power structures that dominate our society, so white supremacist, um, heterosis, ableist patriarchy, um, I don't actually think that there is anything wrong with you if you feel like you're at a disadvantage or you're working within a system that you don't belong in, because that's true. The system wasn't designed with you in mind. It wasn't designed to welcome you. Um, and so I think that telling people that they have a syndrome can actually be kind of gaslighting because often when people are feeling like, I don't know if I belong here, I don't know if I can do it, what they're feeling is um, the system wasn't designed with me in mind and it's making me feel like I wasn't supposed to be here. So I, yes, of course I felt that. Um, as you, as you all saw in that picture of me when I was a frosh, um, I had like, I had dreadlocks when I was, when I was a frosh. I definitely think that like having dreadlocks or not having dreadlocks shaped how I was treated. 
Um, it also shapes like people doing like all, um, like stuff like trying to touch your hair and stuff like that, right? Um, I got told all the time as a first year student that I didn't look like a physics student. And when I would complain to people about like getting these comments, people would say like, oh, but they're just saying that because you dress better than everyone else. So first of all, that like wasn't true. Like I was showing up to the dining hall in my pajamas. Like people were literally just making things up because they couldn't I am accept the possibility that these comments were being made to me because of my identity. Um, but if you have experiences with people doing those kinds of things, um, you're not, there's, there's nothing wrong with you <laughs> for being like, oh, well, maybe I don't belong here because all of the messaging you're getting is that you don't belong here. Okay, so sometimes People try, and this, I, there's, I have much to learn about South Africa. So I'm just going to make this comment from um, an American context. We have, um, ostensibly, we have something called affirmative action here, which supposedly helps um, people from underrepresented um, racial groups and ethnic groups and also white women um, get opportunities that they have historically been denied. The data shows that really, on the whole, only white women benefit from affirmative action in the United States. Um, but it was also the case that while I was at my prospective student weekend at Harvard, I sat through a group of white students and East Asian American students talking about how all of the black students and um, Latino students who had gotten in were all affirmative action cases. As in, we were not quite qualified to be at Harvard, but we had been admitted because of our racial background. Um, which like, when you think about how many people apply to Harvard, Harvard could probably fill an entire class of just black students who are highly qualified because competition to get in is so fierce. So it was a particularly ridiculous comment to make in the first place. Um, but I also think it's easy to walk away from that conversation and think, oh, well, I don't belong here because I only got in because of the color of my skin or because like I checked a box on an application. And I think the thing that people need to think through carefully there, I think that that is the form that imposter, that, that can produce what we might call imposter syndrome. The thing that people need to understand um, is that affirmative action to the extent that it works, which it doesn't really, the data shows this, um, it is an explicit counterbalance to an implicit bias, an implicit imbalance in the system, which is that the system favors white men who are able-bodied and straight and cis. Um, if you are not any of those things, the system is rigged against you. And so it is actually only fair that there should be some kind of promotion of you to counterbalance that. Um, so that's kind of, maybe that doesn't answer the, the question that the in the way that the person expected, but I hope that when you think about imposter syndrome, that you're being very careful in thinking through what have you been told about how to interpret this data that you are getting and experiencing and what is the truth about it? I know that was a long answer, but I think that's an important point to make. Um, yeah, and then I have um, another question here. Um, what do you think that senior researchers and PIs can do to help undergraduate and postgraduate um, people from marginalized backgrounds feel more capable and valued in their research groups? I think, you know, some of my answer goes back to what I was just talking about, right? Which is that like, I'm, I was getting a lot of like weird feedback, like you don't look like a physics major and all of this other crap when I was an undergraduate. Um, and I was also, I came from a low income background. I went to public schools. I was surrounded by people who had gone to fancy prep schools um, or like if they were from outside the United States had gone to their local like American school, which was like much better than public school in Los Angeles Unified School District. And I was getting a lot of feedback of like, those people seem to be faster than I am at everything. Um, and I interpreted that as like something that there was inherently wrong with me. And all I really needed someone to sit me down and say was that they had more of an opportunity to learn how to do these things than you did. And um, speed comes with practice. So I think that it's very important to help students frame the data that they are absorbing about themselves in a correct context. And 
um, also be very careful about talking to them in deficiency terms. So even what I just said, it makes it sound like I was like maybe deficient in some ways, but there were other things that I was bringing to the table, which is that like I got myself into Harvard without like having an SAT tutor. Um, I didn't have my parents like buying all of these resources for me to make it like easier for me to get in. And that means that I brought persistence to the table and anyone who's like done a PhD in physics and like made it into the faculty world knows that persistence is like a really key skill. Nobody said that to me. It would have been useful to know that. And I think it's important for advisors to not just be looking at their students and what is deficient about their backgrounds or deficient about their experience in the world, but actually to look at what are the strengths that the student is bringing to the table because of the ways in which their life has been different. And um, I should say that growing up for me, I and mean, this is going to sound like really hokey, I'm sure, but like Black children my age, we all watched Serafina. We were all glued to Serafina as children. Like for us, um, when Nelson Mandela was freed and came to the United States, like my mom made sure that we went and saw him on tour. When I think about my Black South African colleagues, I think strength. And I want faculty in South Africa to think strength when they're interacting with Black South African students. Because that's, to me, that's what, there is strength there. And so I want faculty to think about what is the strength that is there and how can I help the student utilize it? Um, I think I've just got one last question. Um, yeah, so this was a really interesting question. And what do you think the consequences will be if there are no more uh, women astronomers left in academic institutions or is that something that we're facing? <laughs> I think it was more just like a theoretical question. Um, let's I just like make sure that that never happens. Yeah. I, 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 think, like, I think that that, I mean, if we are in a situation where women are no longer doing astronomy, then like we're in trouble, right? Because it signals all sorts of things have gone wrong in the world. So yeah. I think for me, that's like an apocalyptic scenario. Um, and I think global warming is probably going to get us before that happens. Um, but I think in the scenario where that, that is the situation, probably global warming has gotten us in some really nasty way. And um, we're living like in some kind of weird, messed up Mad Max world. So I think, I think that's my answer is that weird, messed up Mad Max world. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the awesome talk uh, and your answers. Uh, I think now Stabile is going to uh, moderate the questions coming from the chat. So I'll hand over to her. Great. Thanks, Munira. Um, and thank you, especially Professor Scott Weinstein for this amazing talk and all of your insights. Um, so we've got several questions from the chat. I'll begin with Aisha Adam, who says, hi, um, do you think that your political and scientific agendas or goals tend to overlap and influence each other? If so, are there specific avenues or projects that you embark on to combine both? Um, yeah, so I wanna be careful answering this question. So I, I guess like yes and no, in that I think science is always influenced by who we are and what we do and what we believe. I think that that's, I don't think that I'm special. I think that's true about every scientist out, out there. Um, the ways in which it influences like my scientific work is that I think I think more expansively about um, when I'm uh, organizing a conference, I'm like the person who's looking at the, the list of people that we're thinking about inviting and saying, does this represent the community? Are there people who should be in the room that aren't there? I do think that there are a lot of scientists whose political agendas lead them to not ask that question. And um, you get phenomena, like I guess this is getting called the mantle on social media where you get panels that are all men, right? So um, certainly I think in that sense, um, really my, my way of political thinking has made me a more careful community participant in science because I am trying very hard to look more expansively than maybe some of my other colleagues are. Um, I do believe 
you know, one of the central um, lessons of Einstein's relativity is that there's no observer that is more objective than any other observer. And so I, I, I see that as actually there's a political lesson in there, which is that there is no group of people that is more competent than any other group of people at doing physics. And so I, I think that that scientific lesson becomes a political lesson and the, the two do mutually inform each other. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that the things that I have come to educate myself about politically have um, taught me as a scientist. It is the case that there are some scientific questions that I will not work on because my political views are such that I don't do military work. That's the end of the conversation for me. I don't take money from the Department of Defense. Um, I will not impede my students from doing what they want because it's their lives. But um, my students will also know that like, I'm not going to cheer them on if that's the direction they decide to go in. OK, wonderful. I think that gave a, a whole well-rounded answer, at least to Thank that you. question. OK, and the next question is from Ompile Rabiang, who asks, what's your take on sterile neutrinos as possible dark matter candidates? I, this is a great question because actually I'm I'm talking with Brian Shuvi, who is um, I guess like the other queer scientist on particles for justice. We're actually starting to talk about a sterile neutrinos project. So I think they're fun. I guess like as a theorist, I think like anything so for for other people in the audience who may not know what sterile neutrinos are, they were on my my fancy Venn diagram. They're a hypothetical um, type of neutrino. They also are hypothesized to address like an open issue in the standard model. So like axions, they're kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, feed two birds with the same bird feeder situation. And um, yeah, I think sterile neutrinos are fun and interesting. And I, I will say that uh, what dark matter particle people work on, like none, none of us are omniscient. So nobody knows actually what the dark matter particle is. And so in some level, it's always like sort of social as to why we are working on one particle or the other. But I, I did decide that I thought it would be fun to expand a little bit. So sterile neutrinos are, are in my sights. Okay, great. So a wonderful theoretical question from the audience. Another question from Alba Kalaja. I hope I've said that right. Forgive me if I haven't. Um, has asked a thank you for the or has said thank you for the interesting talk. And if time permits, could you please say more about QCD uh, axions forming a Bose-Einstein condensate during the radiation-dominated era in the universe, and possibly explain the consequences on early universe physics? Very important. Yeah. So let me see if I can get back to that slide. I am, I'll just start here. Okay. So I'm in some sense, and I wish I had, I had actually included the slide in the talk, but I was trying to, to cut myself down so that I would say less. I am, when we think about axions in um, a coherent state, we can think of them as acting as like one coherent super particle as what you're seeing with the rubidium 87 data, or you can think of them as acting like one classical wave together. So actually we describe Bose-Einstein condensates when they're in the ground state um, using mean field theory. So basically um, the, the wave function gets treated like a, a, a classical field. Um, and so you can think of uh, these Bose-Einstein condensate axions as basically macroscopic quantum objects that are floating around in space. So I think like buried in there was like sort of the question of this happens during like at the end of the radiation dominated era during matter radiation equality. So that was a long time ago, right? That's in the early universe. So one of the questions is what happens to them afterwards? And the answer is actually we don't know. And this is kind of a, a difficult computational problem because um, it's actually hard, even using n-body simulations, to take objects of that scale and evolve them forward in time in a computational simulation. 
So getting at that question, if how um, these objects would evolve, do they coalesce with each other? What are their collisions like? Do they stay coherent? Should we expect to see these coherent objects in the future? That sort of thing. Um, it's actually not straightforward. So that I would say you're hitting on an open question there too. Okay, great. And another um, related question is from uh, Giorgios Bernardos. Bernardos. Um, how can gravitational lensing constrain axion dark matter on the gal galaxy scale or galactic scale? And can its observational signature be disentangled from other models? Yeah, so there's actually um, a paper that I want to point you to, and I'm pretty sure one of the, I'm not going to remember the name, but one of the authors I'm pretty sure is Luis Ureño Lopez, who is at um, one of the universities in, in Mexico. And I'm... Um, they've been able to show that you can at least set constraints on the mass of the axion using gravitational lensing. So um, we're pretty sure at this point from lots of different observational data that 10 to the minus 22 EV is too light. And probably, I think the, the state of the art constraint now is around 10 to the minus 20 EV. <clears throat> using gravitational lensing actually sets the constraint at around 10 to the minus 22 EV. So that's not something I work on well, no, I guess that's not true. That's not something I've traditionally worked on. I actually have um, a new new postdoc um, who's a Ugandan Canadian, Nathan Musoki. And um, Nathan is actually starting to work on some things relating to gravitational lensing and constraints on axions. He's a computational cosmologist. He's, he's fantastic. Um, so this is actually something that he'll be thinking about. So if there's anybody else who's thinking about this, like please like send me an email. Okay, and a final question on axions, which is uh, a little more fun. It's got a bit of a science fiction feel to it. It's from Mishka, who's asking, will the discovery of axions as more than just theoretical particles have any impact on our understanding of wormholes? I wanna say no, but wormholes are well beyond my area of expertise, so. Um, uh, it is the case that with black holes, we can set constraints on axions. Um, because of black hole super radiance, that we can actually have a scenario where um, the, essentially the axion field synergizes with the black hole. Um, so in the sense that we think of like black holes as like one part of a wormhole, um, maybe, but uh, my suspicion is that axions won't tell us a lot about wormholes, but I'm not an expert on that. So, yeah. Great. All right. And to wrap up the question session from the chat, um, this is from Denisha Pile, who commented by saying, thank you for the informative talk. And the lack of female black doctoral students is astonishing. Do you have any thoughts or ideas as to how we can encourage the future generations to remain in academia? Specifically yeah. the future generations of black women, yes. Yeah, so I think like that's that's a that's a, a great question. And is is that Denisha from the US? Is that Denisha Pile? Okay. She she's um, from South Africa. Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was trying to figure out if it was someone else. Okay. Hi Denisha. Um I think. You know, now that I'm faculty and I've spent some time looking around and watching the conversations, there was a, a Black American woman who earned a PhD in high, high energy particle physics um, before I, I did, um, Lisa Dyson. Um, what we see repeatedly is that people go through PhD programs and drop out of the pipeline or they get they become a postdoc and they don't finish the postdoc and decide not to apply to faculty positions. It's clear that there are a few different phenomena that are happening. So for those of us in the US, many of us go into debt to attend university. I went into debt to attend university. Um, those debt, those student loans went into repayment when I was a postdoc and I was actually having a hard time paying them. Um, and then actually like I met my spouse who ended up paying them off for me because he came from a family that gave him those resources. Um, if you don't get lucky like that, it can present a problem for you actually remaining an academic for, for the trajectory. 
So I think one thing is that postdoc salaries make it difficult for people to stay on the academic track. I am, for those of us who are assigned female at birth and are thinking that we want to have children, um, our prime like childbearing years are also basically during our prime via postdoc become faculty years. And so sometimes people are like, I'm, I don't wanna have to choose between the two and I feel like I have to choose between the two. Um, so I think a lot of what happens is that the academic structure needs to be rethought. And then, you know, people are looking at this and there's like all of this racism and all of this sexism. And they're like, I could just, as I was saying, like Haile Owusu, it gets paid so much more than I do. You can get paid like a lot more to like, yes, maybe face the same racism and sexism, but then at least like you're making bank while you're like facing that, that sexism and racism. And academia doesn't offer you that kind of reward. So I think that a lot of people just look at look at the situation and say, I don't want to give my life to that career path um, because I won't be happy. So I think we really need to rethink the ways in which this career path um, closes off possibilities for people who are family minded, who are community minded, even if you're not thinking about having children, if you come from a community where caring for your elders is very important. Um, which certainly for those of us who are Black in, in the Americas is, is, is an important value, then academia challenges everything about, um, you know, your community values. So I really think that there is a lot of structural incentives to say this isn't for me, this life isn't for me, and, and those things need to change. Okay, I think that's a brilliant answer. Uh, very, very truthful yeah. and full of insights as as your Twitter feed has been full of insights. And I, I can say from a personal perspective, <laughs> your Twitter feed has helped me very, <laughs> very much um, during my, um, uh, my progression through my- I'm glad uh, to hear that. Okay. Yeah, mine as well, especially during the Fees Must Fall era of South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to shout out like everyone who's been involved in, in doing that kind of organizing, because I know that there's a lot of um, a lot of incentive to just keep your head down and focus on on getting your work done and that I'm um, often people tell you that you're being distracted. I'm, um, but I think that you're being community minded and taking the long view of what does my community need to thrive as scientists, in fact, and so it, it's okay to not just think of yourself. And I'm really appreciative of all of the activists who have thought about others as well as themselves. Fantastic, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'll send the comments to you so you can see all the amazing comments about your talk. Um, you have a shout out though from, from the UK for Kilburn from Abigail. Yes. So <laughs> the Kilburn shout out. And I should say that I, I, am, I also am a theorist. I, I leave the, the difficult stuff to, to the, the experimentalists <laughs> and the observers, especially being based at an observatory. But I just want to echo what, uh, what Munira and, and everyone was saying. Oh, please, everyone switch on your cameras uh, so that uh, Chanda can see everybody and you can see who all you've been talking to and you can wave and say hi. But I just wanted to echo um, what our group really, what you've meant for our group. You've really helped us find the voice and um, in really tough times, find the words, find the ways. You've really been an incredible trailblazer. And we really, really appreciate the work that you've done um, in, in helping us stick it out, persevere, strength. Uh, one of our previous speakers said the word wumanja, and I think that we have that in spades uh, as South Africans and as black women and, and women of color. So we just wanted to thank you so much for everything that you've done for being an incredible trailblazer and for making the time to, to give us this talk. Thank you so much, Chanda. Thank you for those kind words and nice seeing all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining. The video will be uh, made available on our website as will the others. And I'll send Chanda all of your, your lovely comments so that she can see those. And um, yes, our next talk will be Maki Yankees and I'll send out a reminder about that uh, in, in a week or so. Thank you all so much for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>